Uh, without, without further ado, we've got Chris Hadfield here. He's from the Minnesota Transportation Center of Excellence. He is also a co-PI for the National Center of Autonomous Technologies, and he's going to give you an intro into AT and uh, ADAS systems. So, Chris, whenever you're ready. Great. Thanks, Zach. Welcome, everybody. Um, so this is going to be a little bit new for me, so if I uh, do a little bit of uh, skipping or uh, don't hit the PowerPoint just right, please let me know, um, and we'll go from there. So I hit the next button. We'll just uh, we'll just have to wait here. Oh, there we go. All right. So welcome to the, your very first session. I hope that everything goes good for you during this virtual reality conference. Again, if you need any help or anything, please don't uh, hesitate to ask or to ask questions or something like that. I think uh, I think during the presentation there is a raise hand um, function, and you can just message me or maybe just blurt it out if I don't see the message um, that you want to ask a question or something like that. Uh, so our very first slide, we have two slides built into one here, two presentations go ahead, built into one. Uh, the first presentation is introduction to autonomous technology, and the other one is uh, passive versus uh, active sensors. So. Um, Again, my name is Chris Hadfield, and I am the Executive Director of the Minnesota State Transportation Center of Excellence. I am a certified ASC Master Technician, a uh, previous automotive technology instructor at a high school and technical college, as well as a previous administrator. And uh, before that, before my educational life, I was an automotive technician and a field service engineer for Toyota. Uh, I also worked for General Motors, which the majority of my training is from General Motors. So. Why is it so important to understand autonomous technology and in its uh, why is it so important to education? I mean, we hear about autonomous and uh, just kind of automatic and self-driving cars and all sorts of self-driving airplanes and everything. Yeah, it's important to understand uh, it in a contextual viewpoint, but it's important by the via the program itself, but it's also important in kind of a more holistic viewpoint. So when we talk about autonomous technology, you know, I, uh, I did a little bit of research online and I found this quote, which has an asterisk and later on down in these slides, you'll see where the quotes are uh, uh, harvested from. Autonomous technologies can significantly increase productivity at enterprises by substantially improving overall equipment effectiveness, reducing costs, improving overall safety, and drive environmental sustainability in multiple industries. So when we think about that, we got to think about why are self-driving cars so popular? Well, they're popular for a number of reasons not just consumer demand that as consumers we continue to ask manufacturers for more but in aviation in marine in land-based transportation as well as manufacturing environments and all other areas of our of our society and industries we are asking for more autonomous technology um, and not only does it improve our lives and our livelihood but in many cases it's this word efficiency now i'm an automotive guy and so uh, i love cars and so when we say the word efficiency often we think about fuel economy but efficiency can also mean reducing the number of crashes reducing the amount of downtime uh, predicting the ability for your vehicle to not get in traffic and sit there and idle and have a significant amount of pollution so in this um, in this uh, session, we're going to talk about what is autonomous technology. We're going to define it. That's going to be a real fun part for me because uh, I get a chance to see a lot of things where autonomous technology is in my particular position. Um, we're also going to talk about what does it look like in different industries. Uh, we're going to talk about the impact on the workforce. And we're going to talk about the impact on education and what's going on in those particular areas. All right. So now this this was a uh, a gif, not a gift, a gif, um, kind of an emoji emotion gift. Uh, so it won't play on here because this uh, screen was converted to a JPEG. But uh, Zach and Zach tell me that later on we'll get these PowerPoint slides to the uh, to the NCAT website. So if you want to download this slide, I would be more than happy. Email me, message me. I can give it to you later. Uh, but it has a lot of cool gifs. The gifs are uh, the gifs are. There's a lawnmower that continues to mow this. Everybody loves the cat sitting on top of a Roomba dancing. And then uh, this is a um, uh, a uh, 
you know, typical Minnesota late October where we might have a little snow on there and then out of the garage comes an autonomous snow blower or snow, snow plow um, to go ahead and just plow my driveway for me so that I can get my car out. The reality is, is that um, in autonomous technology, it's more than just Roombas that have cats dry, riding on them. It's more than just having my lo my tiny little lawn cut for me by the time that I uh, get home. It's more than just being able to have my snow my driveway cleared of snow when I walk outside or when it does that. It goes way beyond that. So let's start looking into different industries. I chose automotive as the first one just because hey. That's where I'm from. I'm from the automotive industry. I live and breathe it. Now, my job is transportation in the center of, center of excellence in Minnesota, but I'm an automotive person true to the core. So right now, the average car uses over one terabyte of data, all because of ADAS, which is a version of autonomous technology. ADAS is Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. And so ADAS is a big deal on cars. In fact, your car that you may be driving or somebody that you know might even have ADAS components on it. And you may not even know it or you may not even think that that particular feature on your car. And so if you think about it, 92.7% of all cars 2018 and newer have some type of ADAS. So that's your put it in reverse and you're too close to the mailbox beeping, which is an ultrasonic sensor, uh, a camera that is on mounted on the windshield and can detect objects. Uh, it can be um, uh, adaptive cruise control. It can be that blind spot detection in your mirror. Lots of different things. I mean, it's just, an, you're right. It's an amazing amount of data. And, and the data, uh, you know, when I first started automotive teaching, we used to compare the amount of data in a vehicle to the amount of data that was needed to launch the first spaceship into, into orbit or to launch uh, Apollo 13 to the moon. And uh, we don't even use those comparisons anymore for, for a number of reasons. One, most of our students weren't born then and don't have a clue what that is. Um, and two, it's not even a fair comparison. Um, so, so far, uh, the other thing in automotive is, is 30% reduction in crashes. 30% reduction in crashes. Now, from a safety standpoint, that's good. Now, if you're in the collision industry, it's not the best thing right now uh, because people in the collision industry and their jobs rely on people crashing but there is there is going to be a period of time where we have autonomous technology and non-autonomous technology blending in with each other and um, you know we're going to have cars that can avoid accidents with cars that cannot avoid accidents on the road together for a period of time and it's just the way it is uh, now I, I don't have this uh, video to play for you um, but you can, you know, the link is here and we'll send it out a little bit later. Uh, this video was going to show kind of the most advanced production capable, mass production capable vehicle out there, which is the Cadillac Super Cruise system. Now, everybody always thinks, oh, the Tesla, the Tesla must be the best thing out there since since sliced bread. It's got to be the most technology. Yes, a Tesla is very advanced technology. Um, and, and by depending on who you can talk about and who who makes the argument, it's either an SAE level two or level three vehicle. And um, I would make the argument it's like a 2.75. The GM's Cadillac Super Cruise, which again, we're talking about mass produced vehicles, not vehicles where they make six of them per year and they've got autonomous technology. This particular vehicle has the most amount. In automotive, just like in most industries, autonomous technology is the most talked about professional development topic. Um, and literally, uh, when and then you'll be able to watch this video later. The most important thing to know about all of autonomous technology and land-based vehicles is that things are changing literally daily. And I don't even uh, my PowerPoint says every day. It's during the day now. Uh, I literally uh, two weeks ago went over to a, a Cadillac uh, Escalade SUV and I was doing some software updates on it in the morning and then later on that afternoon there was another software update. It felt like my iPhone to a certain extent. In fact it was probably more uh, than my iPhone as far as updates go. Now when I say that uh, what I mean by this is this is important to know in autonomous technology is that many vehicles whether it's land, air, or sea have all of these different technologies. So if we look at 
if we look at some of these different things that are on autonomous technology cars, so we've got night vision, LIDAR, radar, cameras, ultrasonic sensors, so on and so forth, a lot of passive and, assist and, and passive sensors, those sensors are hardware. Those components are hardware. We have electronic steering servos, electronic brakes, things that can take over. Those are all hardware. Cars are being built with hardware on them that is significantly more capable than they are being utilized for. So it's kind of like buying a PC for your home that is way more powerful than you need it to be. Like a one terabyte of RAM, for example. You're like, well, when am I ever gonna use this at home? This is just way more than I need. The difference here is, is that manufacturers are putting them on cars and they're putting lots of hardware on cars and vehicles that are way more capable than they need to be because they can update them via the software. And a lot of vehicles are updated on software uh, at the dealership through a scan tool. Some of them are updated through a GPS link. Um, and some of them, like uh, you've heard of OnStar for General Motors. So a lot of them are being updated while you're driving. And some cases, it's being the data is being harvested while you are driving. And so we are getting this data. In some cases, too, we are getting the data after, you know, you know through a black box after an accident or something like that, um, or through a recall. And by the way, every time that you bring your vehicle in for service just to get an oil change, on a new Ford dealership, when your car rolls into a modern day Ford dealership, your car, whether you know it or not, is connecting to Ford corporate and Ford is downloading that data when you're just getting in there for an oil change. And it is wireless and you don't even know it. Um, so, to, so to think that your iPhone spies on you is correct, your car is spying on you to a certain extent. All right, let's take a look at the collision repair. Raise your hand if you have ever been into a car accident. Okay, now I, I don't mean to belittle this. Uh, somebody's raising two hands there. I see um, I see M. Lefebvre is raising two hands there. Maybe it's multiple car accidents. Now I live in north central Minnesota, so uh, it's about that time of year when they, uh, anybody who's working in the collision industry loves it because they, uh, they get a lot of work because we have a lot of deer crossing the road and other animals crossing the road about this time of year. And you know, cars just get hit. Uh, so in the collision industry, Autonomous technology has changed them. They're no longer just painters, body fillers, dent pullers, frame straighteners. They've had to adopt significantly because every time a car gets a tiny little accident, or even if it doesn't, if the accident is maybe suspension damage or vehicle or maybe tire hit hit a curb, they have to go uh, go ahead and realign sensors. They have to be able to diagnose these systems all because they moved a micro inch or even a, a, a you know a, you know one millimeter or even half of a millimeter um, and if you think about it think about like a camera a camera is usually good to approximately a third of a mile so just let's put that into to, to context here if a camera moves 0 0.001 millimeters because of an accident or because uh, another vehicle tapped into it. Maybe it was in a target parking lot and people thought, well, you know, I don't need to really, I, I don't need to turn this into insurance company, right? We could just settle this like adults and it's just a little scratch. I'll just, it'll buff right out, right? We don't need to get our insurance involved. Well, guess what? That one millimeter of movement or 0 0.001 millimeter movement at the vehicle by the camera multiplied by one third of a mile makes it so far off and so far out of adjustment that that camera no longer functions anywhere near what it should be doing and now it is a pointless piece of technology or in some cases your car may automatically break because it sees a deer in the ditch 30 feet off the road and it's not able to distinguish that that's 30 feet off the road versus in the road. And so all of a sudden your car is going down the highway at 55 miles an hour at 7 a.m. when it's dusk. And all of a sudden it decides to hit the brakes. For, for what? what? There was nothing in front. Oh, there was a deer way off in the ditch. But I knew that that deer was not going to come out to the road. Well, your camera didn't because of that little thing. So this picture is an example of... Uh, a vehicle utilizing all of these cool things. It kind of looks like a QR code on the ground, doesn't it? 
kind of kind of looks like a QR code in front of the vehicle, maybe one that's behind the vehicle. It got these weird looking stands and tar. These are called targets, by the way, in the uh, in the collision world. And these targets, oh my gosh, uh, all of these targets are things that the cameras and the sensors are essentially taking pictures of and making adjustments to the software and in some cases making micro adjustments on micro motors up down left right on x y and z angles and so this technician it's it's kind of a setup photo i get it it's not a real world photo it's a setup photo um especially because technicians don't work inside lighting studios like photography lighting studios but i think you get the gist it is a very complex world out there now don't look at the right hand picture where it says connecting trucks just look at the left those three blue trucks uh, now, if you were driving and you saw that those three blue trucks like that, uh, how many of you just just by raise of hand or emoji, how many of you would say, "Geez, man, those two trucks, those trucks are way too close to each other, right? Way too close to each other, right? I mean, if I were a cop, I'd pull them over and say, "Hey, guys, uh, I think you're too close to each other. Aren't there? First of all, isn't there supposed to be two Mississippi in front of in, in between each other? And I don't mean the state of Mississippi. I mean the count one Mississippi, two Mississippi. Let alone your semi trucks, shouldn't you be kind of, you know, don't you weigh 80,000 pounds on the high end? So shouldn't you be doing a little bit more spacing in there? Well, in the in, in the non-autonomous world, the answer is yes. In the autonomous world, the answer is get them even closer together. So this is a real thing. 37 states in, in the U.S. have laws around platooning trucks. And when I say platooning trucks, this is an example of platooning trucks. When a truck aerodynamically um, gets really close to another truck or even a vehicle gets close to a truck, the aerodynamics of the truck allow for each truck, both the following truck and the lead truck and all the other following trucks, to drastically increase the fuel economy. And now this may seem weird. Trucks really don't get fuel economy that's in the best. It's not like driving a Toyota Prius or a t something like that. Um, trucks generally get, older trucks will get six, maybe seven if they're going miles per gallon, if they're going, you know, highway speeds on a good day. And that's with all of these aerodynamic deflectors, which none of these trucks have except for the large aerodynamic over the sleepover cab. Um, generally speaking, uh, it, a new truck can get eight eight and a half nine like if you get into the double digits it's like a miracle of some kind or you're going 55 miles an hour downhill with somebody else pushing you and so now the newer trucks with newer technology are creeping into the tens so when you platoon trucks together you usually see a one to two mile per gallon difference increase both in the lead vehicle and in the following vehicle let's do the math on that the average truck goes 1 million miles before it's before the average before the engine is rebuilt and usually they are sold with about one and a half to two million miles from new so you can buy a truck out there with one and a half two million miles it's been rebuilt once or twice not a big deal that's average cars don't last that long but trucks certainly do trucks make that that kind of mileage because of the amount that they're putting on just do the math in your head i don't need to explain it to you too much further to show you that if you can get one mile per gallon increase over one million miles per truck, then and the average fleet in the United States is 50 trucks. Just do the math. How much fuel do you save? The answer is just a lot. And when you save a lot of fuel, you save a lot of money. So from a commercial standpoint, platooning trucks is something that we're headed towards fast. And it's just because of money. It, that's all it is. If we can reduce operating costs, I mean, we can reduce, <laughs> increase profits, reduce expenses. I mean, this is why all of these trucks that you see here are going towards autonomous technology. And I will make an argument that autonomous technology on commercial vehicles, trucks and off-highway equipment, will be adopted significantly faster than cars because cars only increase their amount, uh, increase the amount of adaptation of uh, autonomous technology because of mostly consumer demand, somewhat a reduction in your insurance premiums. But guess what? Your insurance premiums on cars don't really go down because you have the ability to avoid an accident because the cost of repair of it is higher. My wife's a Subaru, which has a camera on the windshield, 
just had a rock uh, about two months ago. Now, thank God I had insurance and thank God that I called my insurance company when we bought the Subaru and I said, listen, I know that the windshield's expensive to replace, not the windshield itself. Yes, the windshield itself has to be a Subaru windshield, can't be an Abra windshield or the cheap you know, Amazon.com windshield. It's got to be a real factory windshield because the type of windshield and the components and the chemicals in the glass of the windshield have to be correct. My insurance didn't go down, but it did cost the uh, the auto body shop, and thankfully my insurance paid for 100% of it, $2,300 to replace the windshield because they had to go ahead and realign the sensors. So connecting trucks, truck technology, autonomous technology in trucks and off-highway equipment, it's a big deal and it's going a lot faster. Uh, this was my local Menards, a picture. Um, I, I tried to upload a video, but it didn't work. This was actually moving down the road. This is a floor scrubber and the green one is a is a electric forklift and it's electric because it's indoors. Not that electric forklifts are anything new. We've had electric forklifts for a long period of time, mostly in indoors. We either run them off of electric if they're short range or a propane or natural gas if they're if they're long range and indoors and depending on the the warehouse. This is nothing new. Retail and, and warehousing, they're affected by autonomous technology too. Just think about it. How much does it cost to put the te to put uh, the teddy bear in the seat belt and have the teddy bear drive that versus a person who could potentially call in sick and then the floors aren't scrubbed or could potentially hit somebody, hit a display, wreck something, something like that. The pros and cons, there are, and, and I'm not going to get into a... Uh, the, the discussion or the, the argument. I, I will admit that there is an argument out there on autonomous technology with retail and warehouse of, you know, that teddy bear could have been a 15, a 16 year old kid who wanted their first job. And that's the best way to get them into their first job is by putting them on the floor scripper. I can see the pros and cons of both sides and we can all probably make a social, um, you know, a society like uh, uh, argument based on both sides here. But we do have to acknowledge that that is out there. All of the te technology and sensors in both this forklift and then this f floor scrubber at Menards, those are all the same technology and sensors that are on, a, I don't know, a Chevy. And so just to let you know that that's out there and it affects our lives. Here in, in construction, oh boy, I, um, I, I frequently visit one of the programs in Minnesota called the Heavy Equipment Operators and Maintenance Program. And I um, used to help them out. And I, I kind of still do, but it's on their own. They do it now. We get in a lot of the new technology where bulldozers drive themselves. By the way, almost this bulldozer in the picture is a, a hybrid. Yeah like a Toyota Prius hybrid. It actually has an electric drive unit and then it still has a diesel engine, but the diesel engine, like a train, is running a genset and the genset is running uh, those electric motors. This is an example of um, electronic control. If you look closely, there isn't anybody in this bulldozer, none at all. It's basically had a pre-programmed GPS and GIS map that somebody drew out and carved out on CAD and CAM or whatever it is or in this case, Lycra, um, Lycra and Topcon, the two main companies. And they basically have said, okay, we're gonna make this uh, development over here. We're gonna make a road and they're gonna go down to the 10th of an inch. And in construction, for whatever reason, they use tenths of inch, like decimal places of an inch, not fractions of an inch. Don't ask me why, I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> but they can put a Google map on there. They can tell you, yep, I want to get this road over here and I want to get it at this elevation, this slope, this width, et cetera. And I need to move dirt from this pile to that pile. And I need to scrape off the topsoil, add gravel, um, you know, put put granite underneath it, all the subsoils and certain so things. And it can most of it can be done either autonomously or with very little human control or something like that. So for right now, it's not taking over jobs, but it is certainly adding to it. And of course, the complexity of repairing it or diagnosing it or setting it up are actually not only upskilling current diesel technicians, but they're new jobs. A friend of mine works out in Montana and he works for RDO, which is Ronnie D. Offit. It's a large John Deere outfit. Uh, they're both farms and uh, dealership of John Deere's. And uh, he actually is one of the one of the folks that programs the bulldozer, programs the earth mover, programs the excavator, and will be able to tell it what to do. It's a pretty sweet job. This link, when you get a chime, when you get time, goes to Bobcat, by the way. 
it's a video of a skid loader being controlled by a cell phone and told, hey, come pick up this pallet over here. It's full and put it over there by the by the place I want you to put it at. And the bobcat just does it itself. And if somebody walks in front of the bobcat, it knows that it won't run you over. Um, you know, when we talk about autonomous technology in the construction area, there are things like, um, you know, temporary, dangerous, shift, shift work, repetitive, low skilled. Uh, when the Fukushima nu nuclear plant in Japan had to, you know, when we in the tsunami a couple years ago, you know, kind of damaged that plant, and there was a significant amount of radiation. They sent in robots that were autonomously controlled. Two of the folks that were actually um, uh, working for the company and had to fly to a safe part of Japan to actually help those robots be diagnosed and technicians were from one of our automation and robotics programs right here in central Minnesota. Um, and so some of that work that's being done is there. Well, later on, we'll talk about the impacts, but just remember that it be, just think about the impact on education as a result of that. Farming, agriculture, I love this picture of the uh, the operator on the cell phone, probably on the other end, uh, a technician, and he's he's probably saying to him, uh, "iPad number seven says something's wrong," <laughs> and um, and you can just think to yourself, "Well, what really is there seven iPads?" To be honest, the picture only shows two, but there can be. I have been inside a John Deere tractor with up to seven. I'm going to call them tablets, not necessarily iPads. And that's because precision agriculture is a big deal. Again, think about the commercial and think about the semi-trucks. Now, agriculture and off-highway could have been autonomous or had autonomous features for many more years than land-based or you know vehicle or consumer-based stuff. But when we think about uh, the tractor without a cab, by the way, that didn't hit a low bridge. That was designed to be like that. Um, we have the ability and we have technology and we have components out there that do self-driving. We have tractors that uh, as long as somebody sits in it for 24 hours or the sensor has uh, has a seat in it that, that can note that there's more than 60 pounds in the seat and the seatbelt's on, it'll just do its job. It'll cut the corn, it'll harvest the hay, wh whatever it is. And actually I have seen some farmers abuse the systems. On, uh, it's not a safe thing, but I have seen it done where they take uh, bar weights, like, you know, for working out weights, they put them in the seat and then they buckle the seatbelt, they turn the tractor on, tell it what to do, they jump out and they go do something else so they can be at two places at once. Yes, I have seen that happen. Um, but again, farmers aren't doing this. Farmers and those in agriculture aren't doing this to just to increase pro productivity, increase efficiency. What they are doing it for is they are doing it for those reasons, but they're doing it to make sure that things are environmentally sustainable. So, for example, this red tractor is pulling a bunch of, let's assume, herbicides. Okay. Spraying herbicides, farmers don't want to spray over or over spray herbicides. They just want to be able, to, farmers want to be good on the land. They don't want to spray excessive amounts of petroleum chemicals on their thing, but they do know that spraying some of it is necessary. So this precision equipment and precision agriculture can help with guiding through GPS, through photo, through autonomous technology, exactly where it is needed and where it isn't needed to put that chemical. All right, I know I'm a little bit behind here, so I'm going to uh, speed up a little bit. Oh, I hope I didn't skip a slide there. Municipalities and cities. My best friend works at Toro. That's that big red lawnmower in the corner there. And uh, about two years ago, he brought me into the, uh, to, he works at Bloomington, Minnesota, which is where they do a lot of research and design. And uh, they have a little golf course outside of the factory and the, re, the R&D. I actually did some customized training work for Toro a number of years ago. I taught the engineers air conditioning and got them certified in the new systems. This lawnmower, and Toro, by the way, their, their biggest, industry they sell to is golf course management this lawnmower there's no seat on it it's a real rough ride they called it two years ago when i saw it in development it was called the bucking bronco <laughs> and um the reality is there is no seat for a reason there's no person that's needed they design a golf course on gps and gis they program that GPS and GIS to go on to here. The cameras are so good on here that the mower can adjust, measure, see, and cut 
lawn grass down to 30 thousandths of an inch. 30 thousandths of an inch. Can you believe that? That's what the golf courses are being done. And by the way, that's not on the green, uh, the putting green. That's that's the regular course. So just think about that. This lawnmower, by the way, because of all the amount of sensors and all the amount of autonomous technology, uses GPS and GIS. And by the way, not only can it, you know, obviously, if somebody walks in front of it accidentally mow, it can mow several times a day. It can talk back and forth and communicate with the irrigation. It can talk back and forth with the drone and the, and the cameras that are watching the grass grow so that it knows when to mow the grass and when not to mow the grass. You don't mow the grass just because it's Wednesday and it's that time of day to mow the grass. You mow the grass only when it needs to be mowed. And then the, the lawnmower also set, detects when which parts of the grass are growing good and which aren't so that it can precisely apply fertilizer in irrigation in those particular areas and not over fertilize and over irrigate again saving money saving chemicals making the earth a little greener and obviously just keeping things in balance the other cool thing about this lawnmower is when uh, and a, a torrential rain maybe washes out a sand pit or something like that it the sensors on it know that, detects that, adjusts the GPS GIS map, and sends an alert to somebody, a technician, that, hey, you might want to come check this out. I think last night's rainstorm really did some damage to the sand pit. Uh, my favorite thing in the bottom there from municipalities and cities, I work with the city of White Bear Lake right now <laughs> on this uh, blue and green smart i love how they put smrt for smart but uh they they put this a little this is called a shuttle there's no steering wheel in that by the way um it just is a shuttle that goes back and forth autonomous technologies this particular one um and the one that i'm working with in the city of white bear lake and with the minnesota department of transportation to do is specifically for um people with disabilities and the elderly so that we can get them in two places back and forth um, and actually this particular one you can't really see it because it's on the curb but it's picking up somebody that's blind and it's picking that person up and it's dropping them off at the store and in this particular case and this is close and near and dear to my heart because my nephew is blind and, uh, and he's my godson by the way and uh, and um, I'm going to see him this evening and he's coming over and I'm just so excited for the future when he is able to feel independent he's able to live his life same thing with our elderly folks so autonomous technology is also about improving lives it's about creating our communities it's about diversity and inclusiveness it's about helping others uh, one of my favorite things this uh this little weird looking straddle of an audi that's a german germany airport and that's a car caddy it's a taxi it literally is a forklift that lifts your car up and autonomously parks it no more valets by the way jaguar has a, a feature on their car called valet so you go up and you drive up to the front door of the hotel, you push a button, then you find a parking spot and you push another button. Then you drive back up to the front door and you get out and your car will now park itself on valet. And then when you wake up in the morning, you want to get out, you just stand at the front door and you use your cell phone or Siri and you call your car and it will come with to you. I wish they really had that in real life with my uh, black 1985 Pontiac Firebird with the lights going across the, you remember Kit, the car? Okay. Aviation. Now, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not, I got a friend of mine when I was uh, reviewing this PowerPoint said I should put a picture in here if you remember the movie Airplane. Autopilot's been around for a number of years, hence the 1983 movie, right? But in aviation, autonomous technology has been there for a longer period of time than a lot of other things. And most of that is safety. Uh, Zach Nicklin and his, and, uh, his team over at Northland Community Technical College are going to talk a lot about drones and a lot about other things. I think there's a lot of known here. Um, but just to let you know that, look, they've been in there for a while and they're doing some things that you wouldn't think. A lot of people instantaneously go to the whole Amazon drone um, and they think to themselves, oh, it's the Amazon drone. That's what's... Uh, Remember this thing, the Amazon drone, it's going to deliver all our packages. Well, that may happen sooner or later. And it may happen because of technology, and it may happen because of workforce. I think that's no secret that the technical workforce has a shortage. An example is, yesterday, I'm sitting on my deck waiting for the kids to get off the bus at about 2.33 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so I get the kids off the bus, and 
shortly after the bus leaves, there's a U-Haul that pulls into my yard. And I'm like, well, what is there a U-Haul truck doing in my yard? Well, it's the UPS guy. So the UPS guy jumps out and I'm like, oh, what happened to your regular truck? Uh, my, my package from Amazon came in the mail. And he says, uh, they, we don't have enough technicians and my truck is broken and it's going to be two more weeks before they even look at it. This is the story of my life. Amazon packages by drone, probably not that far away. Autonomous technology and aviation can also help us with fighting forest fires. Here you see, uh, Zach will tell you more about thermal cameras. Um, and here we can see, we can talk about some of those California wildfire, wildfires, preventing a lot of these issues, finding lost people in the woods, um, you know, being able to do a lot of the things that maybe from a human standpoint, we are limited either financially, human resource wise, or other. All right, my next one. Uh, a little a little hint about me and my personal self. I love fishing. Love it. I love fishing. I um I love fishing so much that it's kind of dangerous. And uh, I get out in the yard. Whatever my wife says to me, can we talk about how much you're spending on fishing lures? I go out in the yard and say I'm I'm uh, I'm busy in the yard, and I have a comb, uh, and a and a ruler and uh, scissors and I'm cutting my two acres that way and that's how I avoid the conversation of how much did I spend on fishing lures I've got a boat now I had a video that was pretty good and I've got a boat that's got this exact same system uh, if, the, if you're thinking that's me that's not me it is a Minnesota picture but uh, I don't catch bass that big all that often I, I uh, at least if I do I, I don't really take a good picture of it um, that uh, trolling motor right there is GPS controlled so for me, when I have two young kids and those two young kids want to go fishing, everybody that's ever fished with young kids know that lines get tangled, things get snagged. Um, sometimes uh, a young niece of mine doesn't want to put the gross little worm on there, and you have to take care of that. Yet I have to troll it. I have to move the boat. So what do I do? I just program my boat, and I tell my boat, Here's the line I want to stay at. I want to stay at a 17-foot contour depth. So I get a contour map of the lake. I program it in that I want to stay at 17 feet, and I want to troll. And my boat will just drive around the lake by itself at the pre-programmed speed that I tell it to do. And I can go ahead and leave my hands off it and help my nieces and nephews and kids fish. And I can have a lot of fun. It, to be honest, autonomous technology in the marine side improved my life. So when we talk about life and improvement and things like that, it improved my life because I was able to spend more time. Jill is Andy and the Marine Advanced Technology Education Mate and Mate 2 um, will tell you a significant amount of this. But in, in the underwater world, in Mate, and I think I see, oh, there, yep, there's Jill in the, uh, hi, Jill, everybody. And Jill's wearing a super awesome hat today. It's very, uh, very, <laughs> very color coordinated. Um, the Marine Advanced Technology Education, when we talk about autonomous technology, we talk about stuff above water and large ships being guided, but we talk about underwater stuff too. Pipelines, gas, utilities, other things like that. Uh, there's a, such a huge world, and I, I'm not going to steal any of Jill's thunder on that. Um, Jill's in the middle of the room if anybody is looking. I, I can't wave my hand, Jill, but I can nod. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, oh, hang on a second here. I, I think I clicked on something incorrectly there. Hang on one second. All right. Uh, Jill, I guess if I click on that, it brings up my email to you. Okay, uh, manufacturing. This, uh, again, was supposed to be a GIF. I think we've seen this a million times. Robots building cars. Yes, robots build cars, but they also uh, help things. Um, robots in cars, building, manufacturing, automation, we all know it's there. But the bottom line is that automating a production facility increases production, reduces cycle times, improves quality, creates a safer and a more competitive workspace. When we compete in the workspace, we all know what happens. Okay. All right. This is my favorite part. So that kind of summarizes. Uh, I know I'm running a little behind here, Zach and Zach, and I apologize. Um, are there any questions so far? Okay. Let's keep moving on here. All right. How does autonomous technology impact the workforce? So University of Michigan's Economic Growth Institute and Sarah and Ben that um, 
oh, 20 minutes thing stack, I, I really don't know that I'm going to be able to get done with all of the slides and all 56 slides, but we'll go from there. Okay. How does it impact the workforce? This is my favorite subject. Uh, the University of Michigan and their economic development group really helped us out here. Take a look at this chart. So I'm a technician um, and, I, and I, I, I take pride on the fact that I'm still certified. I'm still able to hold my own and keep my pencil sharp fixing a car. But I, w I was a technician and I started out my career in the 1990s. I can remember my days in high school when they were like, you see this thing called a digital multimeter or a digital vote ohm meter? Here's the difference between the analog and the digital version. And I remember that. So very, very little of my career in the beginning was, you know, electronic. Very little of it. Some, but not a whole lot of it. And as our technician age uh, workforce ages, our educational systems have to evolve as well. So in the 2000s, I remember uh, my high school teacher in the 1990, early 90s saying, hey, Hadfield, better pay attention to this electrical fundamentals thing because you're going to need it in the future. Not today, not tomorrow, in the future. He knew, he knew. And he knew because look in the timeline, we started to introduce software things. I remember in the late 2000s, in the late 90s, when we had an electronic issue with the car, a software program, we ordered a new prom trick, prom chip, programmable read only memory chip. We physically took the computer out of the car. We physically took the prom chip out. We cleaned it and then we put a new one in that Detroit sent us. Today, in the 2000s then, we started to actually do these things called programming. We would sometimes send the whole entire computer in the black box out and get a new one in, but it was just reprogrammed. Oftentimes there was somebody that you could call that not every shop had one. Today, we have a significant a more amount of software. Um, again, uh, earlier this summer in June, I rebuilt the transmission on my truck. And after I rebuilt the physical components and the, and the actual components on the transmission on the truck, I put it back into my truck um, and I rebuilt it because I'm now pulling a camper and I need to, I need a little bit more, uh, I need a little bit more oomph, so to speak, in my truck. Uh, I rebuilt it. And before I even turned the key on, what's the very first thing I did? I reprogrammed the transmission control module. And so you have a technician in the, in the education workforce has to recognize that we're not done with mechanical stuff. We just have less of it. And all the mechanical systems are there. We just have less of them. I, uh, I really take uh, um, pride in the fact that the folks that I work with can, can understand this and can help us out a lot. How does it impact the workforce? Well, obviously we're increasing safety and in mobility for communities, but this increased activity is, is development. It's not a bad thing. Autonomous technology will change jobs. There will be some jobs that are lost. There will be some jobs that are new and gained. A significant amount of jobs will be upskilled, modernized, evolved, just like the last slide that we talked about. And this adaptation to the technology is something that we have to look at. Most of the changes in, in the workforce will be a result of existing careers and jobs. So there won't be a lot of, at least in the next 10 years, there won't be a lot of new, 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 brand new, completely brand new, never heard of jobs. There'll be modifications of current jobs. And, you know, service techs, the folks that I work with a lot, uh, they will have to diagnose, maintain, repair, and update this complexity. And, and a, certainly a deeper understanding is what we need. So as educators, what do we have to know about autonomous technology? Foundations, foundations, foundations. Electricity is always going to be electricity. Ohm's law will always be Ohm's law. Kirchhoff's law will always be Kirchhoff's law. The laws behind series and parallel circuits and all the math and algebra, math it will never change. Circuits will never change. The laws will never change. Science won't change. So when we teach our high school and tech college and university students that the voltage across the circuit is equal to the, resist, the current through a circuit times the resistance of a circuit, when we, by the way, if you can't tell my uh, my teacher in tech college or in, in the, at the university, <laughs> he uh, he forced me, drilled me to memorize that sentence in a good way for a good reason, because when you understand funda foundational and fundamental electronics, you can be able to adapt to the systems that will be in the future. So the foundations, absolutely, and 
to a certain extent now I would make an argument we need to put more work more energy more understanding and we need to have more students understanding the fundamentals and being able to be skilled walking out of that course or classroom about the fundamentals electrical and electronics well computer controls more things more and more i can't think of a single circuit system on a car or a truck or a boat or an airplane that isn't computer monitored in other words that isn't electronic the difference between an electrical switch and, and something is so think about it this way a peterbilt semi truck and the and the voltage going through that headlight compared to the signal being sent to turn the engine on on a boat or an, or an rov is the same type of fundamental principles it's the same thing the voltage going through a rolls royce is the same thing as the voltage going through a peterbilt truck so we have to understand electronics because computers are controlling everything there aren't a whole lot of electrical circuits out there anymore they're mostly electronic meaning computer controlled or some type of programmable logic control Industry 4.0, um, how many, raise your hand if you've heard of this term, Industry 4.0, or the Internet of Things, or give me a little, uh, give me a little of this thing right here, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, exactly, Industry 4.0, students need to know about this, it doesn't matter if they're, people always think, oh, Industry 4.0, that's for manufacturing students, not transportation, or anybody else, no, wrong, it's for everybody, because Industry 4.0 and the Internet of Things, Vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to grid, vehicle to map, and vehicle to infrastructure. Vehicle to vehicle is an example as the pl truck platooning. When the front truck taps the brakes, within a nanosecond, the following trucks tap the brakes. That's why they can stay so close. There's zero reaction time. I mean, there's a one or two picosecond reaction time between those vehicles to tap the brakes. That's why they can be so close to each other. When there's a a pothole in the road and the first truck needs to be able to swerve all the other trucks swerve within two nanoseconds well actually it's two picoseconds and so think about that that's why we need to know vehicle to vehicle industry 4.0 and when by the way uh, uh i had a truck that came in uh to uh, me the other uh, probably about six months ago and the the semi truck was the complaint was my cruise control doesn't work all the time and I said, well, let, let's get a little more context here. Turned out the cruise control was just fine. The cruise control didn't work when it was raining. The reason the cruise control didn't work when it was raining, because on that semi truck, the owner of the semi truck, the warehouse that owned that semi truck, which was Walmart, by the way, programmed it so that the cruise control wouldn't work when it was raining. And the rain sensors tell the cruise control, hey, don't turn on doesn't matter what the inputs are you're not going to allow it and i'm going to override that walmart basically said for safety reasons when it's raining out i don't want cruise control on because i don't want you to you know do the things that cruise control may have so just to give you an example on the education side employability and soft skills we need technicians to be able to read at a high level we need them to be able to react Remember that picture of the John Deere where the tech, where the, where the operator is calling on the cell phone? Those are soft skills and having the ability to react and talk it through, to be able to write it down. I was uh, visiting a Caterpillar dealership where they were replacing an $80,000 engine on, a, on a, an excavator. $80,000. By the way, that was a used engine. <laughs> uh, it was supposed to be under warranty and uh, it was like some kind of an extended warranty. And the dealership uh, had, technician had not done a very good job of communicating what made the engine go wrong. And so even though the tech, because of that inability to write it down, communicate and talk about and have those soft skills, Caterpillar denied the $80,000 refund or uh, warranty claim from the, from the dealership initially. Now they did have a conversation and they did end up reimbursing the dealership. But my point is, is that employability and soft skills are important to everybody, especially because of autonomous technology. I'm going to talk, Zach, I do know that I'm running low on time here, and I don't know that we're going to get to the other slides. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about these last two real quick, because these are important. Industry partnerships, probably one of the most important things on there. This equipment's expensive. Uh, we, I was, uh, I was at uh, a truck program in Northeast Iowa uh, about a year ago, and uh, they were telling me, I just can't afford all this stuff. 
And I and I said, well, what do you mean? They said, I can't afford a hundred and fifty thousand dollar semi truck. I can't afford a two hundred thousand dollar bulldozer with all this technology. But my industry is saying that it's important. It's important that the students actually know and understand and get exposed to. So, uh, employer partnerships. We helped them out with getting an employer partnership where the employer could bring down that bulldozer off season, off peak, not in use, and be used by the students. All this, all the school had to do was put some fuel in it and go get it. Um, Work-based learning, professional development, it's more and more important that we help our teachers stay on top of things, to stay on top of things that change. It's more important every now and then to stay cutting edge because things are gonna change. And to think that as education, educators, we have all the resources and we have all the answers, uh, we don't. We know we don't. Diversity. A year ago, I was recruiting in a high school classroom for automotive technology that high school classroom was the it classroom it was the computer science class i got four students that came out of that classroom that ended up going into collision repair three in collision repair and one in automotive technology and one of them later on to went to go to automotive engineering technology at minnesota state in mankato you know why they wanted to do that because they loved the electronics they're in those programs right now and actually uh scott brown who's a good colleague of mine he's an auto body guy and he loves painting and stuff but he recognized a couple years ago the uh, ability to understand electronics and electrical system with autonomous technology and he makes his living he doesn't paint cars he doesn't do any of that kind of work anymore he understands and he goes around to shops training technicians and fixing cars that got into issues similar to what i did in the the late 2000s where i had a company called twin city hybrid and i walked around to collision shops with a pair of rubber insulated gloves and a digital multimeter for shops that didn't know how to unplug a hybrid after it got into an accident so diversity we can in we can increase the types of students in our classroom we can offer more technology we can we can offer career pathways that people never thought of to audiences that we never thought could be in there um, one of the students that was in that IT classroom that's now on a collision repair technology program at one of our Minnesota schools she and I say the word she because uh, uh, it is gender gender traditional is male in the auto body collision industry. It's over. It's heavily dominated by male. She is extremely successful and she is loving her job. And here's the cool part. She didn't understand or know that auto body was actually kind of a little bit of an art, kind of a little bit of a science. She loved her art class. She loved clay pottery. She loved taking that piece of clay that fell off the turntable and fell into a piece of muck and then building it into a shape. That's what auto body is. At least that's what it is to her. And that's what she made it. Okay. These are my web resources that I used for this presentation. And uh, I uh, really apologize for the timing here, Zach and, and everybody that um, I took 60, uh, 55 minutes to do one presentation and I was supposed to do 55 minutes for two presentations, which was active and passive sensors. And I, uh, I very much apologize for that, uh, that I, I probably am not gonna be able to get to this. So um, hopefully you found this, uh, this presentation uh, good for you and hopefully you got some answers, maybe some things that you didn't know of earlier. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. You can email, call, text, send me a little heart uh, emoji <laughs> um, uh, or something like that. I, uh, I'll, I'll put the, uh, the blushing emoji for me.